um, I'll show you the route we're going to take. Uh, you are sitting here and this map of 1876 will show you uh, about there. There are the schools still in the, in the chaos of building but nevertheless uh, you're here along Trinity Road marked in red there which was not here in 1876. Almost a hundred years later, 1972, this road was carried through. Um, when the uh, large part of the little park, which we're going to visit first, uh, was sold for housing, and that's Marchant's Road, etc., uh, and the village centre and library, all developed in the 1970s. So uh, we're 40 years on from that, but this road did not exist. If we look at a pair of pictures uh, of the area, uh, the bottom one, I'll pass it round, it's easier to do. The bottom one shows a view of this end of the school from over the road there, uh, quite modern but not up to date. And the one above shows a much earlier view and if you look at the bottom of this upper picture yes. you will see a track mm -hmm. running along there and that is the track in this map go the right way round which goes from where you are now to Little Park and in fact a couple of years ago I'll pass, pass those pictures around now so that you can have a look while I'm carrying on talking Okay, um, a couple of years ago, someone emailed me to say that he had been evacuated as a schoolboy from Rotherhithe in the docks in London, uh, and he was the only one of his school who was not billeted up by Hurstbier Point College. He was billeted somewhere in the middle of the village, and he wanted to find out where that was. So we, we found where his digs had been and he said, oh that track, I swung on a gate there uh, and watched the cows and that was in the 1940s you see. So that track was there for a long time um, and uh, we will go along to Little Park Farm as soon as you all had a chance to look at the pictures uh, as our first port of call. And in fact, this is what will happen during the afternoon. We shall walk a hundred yards or so, stop and chat, walk another hundred yards and stop, and so it goes on. I will show you the rest of the course we're going. Uh, all right, yep, thank you. We are going from here Let's turn it round your way, going from here along Little Park to the, along Trinity Road to the entrance to Little Park and then up the Twitton by the Health Centre to the High Street, then a little loop round West Furlong Lane, someone here from the Furlong House, one of you. The Red House, I don't know what it is. The Red House, yeah, well, Fur Furlong House, yes. Uh, we shall get to there in that loop round and then westward to the White Horse at the end of the village. So that's how we shall wend our way. And as I said earlier, if anyone feels they have to drop out, I shan't uh, feel affronted. <laughs> right, let's move on to Little Park Farm, which is just beyond the um, uh, cul-de-sac sign uh, you can see in the distance. A question, why Little Park? There was a great park, and where might that have been in Hurstfield Point? Well, Danny, Danny, Danny. Danny, Danny, yes, exactly. So what kind of park? Deer Park? Deer Park, yeah, absolutely. And this map of 1610 is just the centre bit of Sussex, and it, right bang in the middle is Danny and right above it is Hurst. Mm -hmm. So there's the Great Park and the Little Park 
of Hurst-Pierpoint Manor. And in 1335, here in Little Park, there were 80 head of deer, um, including 30 young, and they had the lovely name Rascals. <laughs> um, so um, there were, it was uh, a deer park in, in connection with the great park at Danny. Danny was never and is not now the manor house. Uh, it was uh, 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 like Topsy, it grew rather from a hunting lodge. And the manor house was right near the church. And we'll go past that later on in the walk. And this map that I showed you is 1610. So it was still a deer park recently at least before that date. By 1644, it had ceased to be a deer park. It had become a farmhouse. Uh, and in, in that year, it was sold to a Mrs. Anne Swain, who had other property here in Hearst. And it was sold to her by a man who uh, featured on the national stage for a short time. He was Sir William Jackson. He was a churchman and a very high, fl high flyer in the church. He, he, after having been a vicar for some short time, he became Dean of Worc Worcester, Bishop of Hereford, Bishop of London, and eventually Archbishop of Canterbury. So you should all know his name. Uh, his big particular claim to fame is that as Bishop of London, he administered the last rites to Charles I on the scaffold. Uh, so we should all know his name, but no one does. Uh, uh, he didn't live here. He had property all over uh, the West Country, particularly his um, main house was in Gloucestershire. But um, this property passed to Anne Swain. She died and her son inherited, and in 1677, he sold it to Thomas Marchant. Now, I shall talk a lot more about Thomas Marchant, but not this one. Uh, people in those days had an annoying habit of naming their sons without any variety. Mm -hmm. Thomas, William, Thomas, William, Thomas, William, I know those at least. And we're now talking about Thomas the first of that group. Not as bad as at Danny, where the, the Gorings who built the present Elizabethan house, George, George, George and George. <laughs> Let's now open the gate. Will a gentleman stand in front of that censer, please? Or a lady, I don't mind. Just stand in front of the censer. Yeah, otherwise it keeps shutting. <laughs> Uh, when I finish talking, we can walk away and it will shut. Uh, there is Little Park Farmhouse, Little Park as it's now called, and the entrance in the time I'm talking about was beyond that white wall, white door going into the uh, elevation that you can't see. And it remained like that until uh, they uh, put in a new front door and put a double chimney uh, surrounding the new front door. Can anyone guess at what date that uh, alteration was? But it was Victorian and, uh, and unusual for the Victorians. They didn't impose their own style suddenly. They tried to get something in keeping. Uh, and uh, the fire, there was a fireplace in each of the downstairs rooms and joined into a single stack and out at the top with the um, chimney pots. Uh, Stonehenge, as you look at in front of you, is um, 2010, uh, very recent. Between Stone Stonehenge and the front door was part of the original structure because early on this was a hall house. And the hall house, um, uh, perhaps I ought to explain briefly, is where there was a central hall. 
and the smoke went out to the roof uh, at the top. That was demolished long ago, but that's about the extent of the hall between the stones and the present front door. If you look at the roof, uh, it's composed of Horsham slabs, uh, very local, very heavy, and the heaviest ones are at the eaves and gradually diminishing in size until you go up to the um, um, ridge of it. Um, and we've been here 57 years, and the first time during that period that they had to replace the uh, roof timbers, it was done by cowboys, so they had to do it again. So we've been here while they've replaced the roof timbers twice. It needs very strong timbers in order to support that weight of roof. Inside, um, there are one or two things to mention. In the kitchen, not uncommon in those days, there were two bread ovens and a salt cellar. And also in the kitchen, behind the dining table, although they've now moved the kitchen to another room, but in the original kitchen, behind the dining table was a long carved uh, panel in oak, which had fishes on it. And that was because uh, the Marchants, Thomas, William, Thomas and William, were farmers, but in particular they were fish farmers. And again, looking at the map originally, we have to keep going back to that. If you look at Little Park, there is the house, and there is a fish pond, and there is another one. And they bought little fry, very small, and grew them on until they were of sufficient size for the table. Um, because in those days, the major stock, uh, cattle, sheep and pigs, had to be slaughtered as winter approached because it was insufficient fodder for them. So fish and doves or pigeons were a very valuable source of fresh meat during the winter. And I'll show you where the dovecot was when we get to the end of the war. The manor extended over quite a large area, so we're here where the fish uh, were being um, brought on. Uh, a couple of years ago on, on this walk, there was a lady from Danny who said, ah oh, yes, um, we have a Polish gentleman with us at Danny and he saw a small carp in one of the ponds there and he fished it out and put it into one a pond on its own and grew it on and had it for his Christmas dinner. <laughs> because in Eastern Europe, they still think the carp is a Christmas delicacy. Um, and um, I've never eaten one, but nevertheless, I gather they're pretty bony, but um, uh, they were very valuable food in the winter. They grew these on in, the, in those fish ponds and they were nourished in all sorts of ways. But in, in particular, I mentioned the fact that in one of the bedrooms was a, an en suite privy. And the outfall went into the nearest pond. Uh, so they had a little extra nourishment. <laughs> right, now let's walk up the Twitten and pause for a moment or two at Ribbit's Cottages. Now, Ribbit's Cottages were built in the early years of the 19th century uh, as farm labourers' cottages. Not surprising, because Little Park was just a few yards that way, and Trumpkins, which I'll talk about in a few minutes, was another smaller holding that way. So um, these were nicely placed. Um, their occupation might shock you now because in these eight small cottages, five along there, three along there, each cottage would have three or four farm labourers and their families. Um, and the census from 1841 to 1901 shows that density of occupation. 
except in 1871 when suddenly it drops. Now it drops because there was an agricultural depression and they weren't wanted on the land so they couldn't stay in their little cottages and probably they went into the workhouse. Um, and we'll talk about the workhouse again in a few minutes. One of the problems with this walk is that I talk about things as we pass them geographically, but we dodge from one century to another without reference to where we, where we walk, and we can't do anything about that, so you'll have to keep up. <laughs> <laughs> one particular thing about Ribbit's cottages is that they are numbered, uh, or were numbered one to eight, this is number eight, uh, and they were numbered by 1841 one to eight, whereas the High Street itself was not numbered even by 1901. Um, why it was not num numbered earlier, I don't know. I know it was an absolute pain when I was researching the High Street because I was never sure that Bill Jones was in that house there or was he in that one there, you know, because they weren't numbered. Uh, and the census enumerator just recorded them house by house as he found them. Right, I think we can move on to the high street. Uh, Carl's Place was built uh, to replace some very unsanitary cottages um, and pretty derelict buildings. There they are. Uh, there is the entrance to Pit Lane, which we're going up shortly. Uh, and this was Carl's Cottage and Harding's Cottage. And you will note particularly that Hurstpier Point built up High Street, finished there, where it says Carl's Place. Uh, this photograph, I mean, photographs only became regularly used in the 1840s, 1850s. Uh, we don't know the date of this photograph, but certainly that was the end of the village then. Let's come back to Card's Place. I tend to rather be naughty and cheat the children and say, look at the half-timbered building across the road. What sort of date do you give it? And more or less to a child, they say, oh, Elizabethan. And I tell them to look up and you always have to look up, particularly in a street which is given over to retail uh, activities um, because the ground floor has changed and changed and changed. Look up and see what you can find from uh, the upper stories. So this was built in 1900 uh, at the instigation of the incoming rector, uh, Richard Bevan, who decided that those cottages were, uh, ought to be pulled down. And because Philip Card lived in the cottage where Gibson's now is, it was called Card's Place. And the Latin scholars amongst you will be able to translate the motto up above there, won't you? You all rush to do it, won't you? So I will tell you, it's, I and my house will serve the Lord, which seemed appropriate as it was the rector who got this lot erected. And note that the original division between houses and shops with flats above was there in 1900. We put in two houses and the other properties were retail with flats above. And that stayed like that to this day. Turning beyond what was the end of the village and look at Mission McKay and Helter Skelter, again, if you look up, you will see that it was once one building. And at the end of the 19th century, it was occupied by a, 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 prep, a prep school for boys uh, called Hamilton House um, and boys from Brighton, Lewis, 
East Grinstead, uh, London, all came here because their parents were told that Hurstfield Point was healthy. And I think it was certainly physically, is still physically healthy. Uh, I'm not sure how one of the pupils developed his moral health because he was Aubrey Beardsley, who um, was responsible at the end of the century, 19th century, for producing the yellow books of doubtful um, morals and illustrating a number of the programs for um, Oscar Wilde's plays, in particular Salome. Um, and so um, he had his own, uh, own slant on life. Looking to the east, uh, the building which juts out, which uh, now has Emmy, the flower shop, uh, flower shop, dress shop, uh, in it, uh, is the oldest documented building in the centre of the village. We have documents dating 1450, which means that it was here before. When we go further down the high street, uh, you will find that uh, there are uh, one or two older buildings, but nevertheless, the, that's the oldest for which we have documents. Uh, where Hampers, Fatfish and Keek and Coal uh, are now was a single building, although it was just being converted in the 1830s uh, by Harry Broad to start his butcher's business there. All right, one, one whole house. Coming further on to the west, you look at a building which those of you, us who are old enough will recognise the architecture. Wherever you went in the suburbs of London and you saw that architecture, Barclays Bank. And it was Barclays Bank for a long time and now it's the cruise line. And we know that that is the building that existed be before because there's, there's an there is a photograph of the chemist shop. Um, not a chain like Lloyd's, but the uh, shop run by William Mitten and his two daughters, Flora and Bessie. Flora was one of the very first ladies to qualify as a pharmacist in the first group. Uh, Bessie did not do that, but she also helped in the shop. And Flora continued to run the business after her father died. Now, when he died, uh, he had uh, four, what was converted into four pages of A4 obituary in the trade journal and that trade journal was not the chemist or the pharmacist but the bryologist. He was an international authority on mosses and ferns. So much so that when he died his collection of mosses and ferns was bought by the Botanic Gardens of New York and it's there to this day. So this was a village chemist who was doing something Hello. else. Hello. Um, uh, we shall see where he lived uh, later on in the wall, right at the end of the walk in fact. But nevertheless, um, uh, that's William Mitten and his shop. Where Lloyd's now is, was this property which was occupied not by uh, this chap, Russell, uh, originally, but in the early 19th century by a chap called John Chandler, who was a blacksmith. And where was his forge? Over there. And there, quite well on into the 20th century, is uh, the farrier shoeing uh, an ag uh, and when we came here, it had ceased to be a blacksmith, but it had become a car repair shop, which is, a, you know, it's in the same line of business. So it's still called the Old Forge. By standing here to chat, I can kill, kill three birds with one stone. Before I talk about the workhouse,
just look behind you at the house over there with the white chimney stacks. Quite a substantial house. I think it's five bedrooms, I'm not sure. Anyway, it was built by the manor for William Mitten's father, who again was also, surprise, surprise, William Mitten. He was the butler at Danny and um, clearly well thought of because otherwise they would not have built such a substantial property for him. Look at the censuses and you find that he is the head of the household in 1841 and in 1851 and in 1871, but not in 1861. Elizabeth Mitten is the head of the household that year, but William Mitten was still around because he was down on the form 10 years later. Where was he in 1861? Hmm? I've told you. He was the butler at Danny, so that's where he was on census day. <laughs> Uh, he, his name appears at the head of the servants at Danny on that day. Um, so um, that's where he was. Now let's turn back to the workout. First of all, I can show you uh, a picture of the building that uh, was the workhouse. From 1601 in the Elizabeth first, first reign, Parishes were responsible for looking after their own poor. Uh, and they either supplement, gave them a small income when they were out of work in their own cottages, or if um, the thing got more desperate, they were moved into the parish workhouse uh, and looked after there. And the money from that came from the farmers and traders who were not in the workhouse uh, who had to supply the poor rate. And uh, when, as in 1871, there, were, there was an agricultural depression, a number of paupers, uh, the needs of the poor rate went up. And there was a bench of magistrates in Berkshire in a place called Spenham Land, which is now within Newbury, who in their wisdom decided that um, the way to deal with the paupers was to give them a quartern loaf, which is twice our present large loaf, per member of the family. Uh, and so eventually this got so out of control that at Sloughan, further up, um, where they're doing the A23 at the moment at Hand Cross, 75% of the population were paupers. That meant that 25% of the rest of the population were looking after them, but that's not even true. Because that 25% meant the poor rate payers and their families. So very few men were contributing to the poor rate wasn't quite as bad as that here in Hearst, but nevertheless, it became totally out of control. So the government eventually got round to the fact that this was being silly. And in 1834, they passed the Poor Law Amendment Act, which called for the abolition of the parish workhouses and the establishment of union workhouses, where a group of parishes were brought together in with one workhouse and ours was the one at Cookfield, later Cookfield Hospital and now Desirable Apartments. But it was built during the 1830s and early 40s and this place was closed in 1846. This ground we're standing on, the recreation ground, was until uh, 1900 called Town Field. And that hints that it was used for agriculture. And we know that in the 18th century, Mrs. Beard from the Mansion House, which we will come to eventually, grazed her cattle here. Uh, so it was used for agriculture in the centre of the village. Maybe not on a large scale, but nevertheless, that was the town field. And going out of it, down the Twitton, which we shall go down into West Furlong Lane, 
and then if you can in your mind's eye think of the footpath which goes from the old parish room down to the Brighton Road together they form a sort of S bend and the reason for the S shape is that the ploughs were drawn by oxen now, oxen are very powerful beasts but not very manoeuvrable. <laughs> they come to the headland and they couldn't turn quickly so they had to make a wider sweep and it gradually the S developed in their ploughing. While we're still here, before we go down the Twitton, we look at Furlong House it now is. Richard Bevan, I told you, uh, got Card's Place built on the high street when he came to the parish to succeed Carey Hampton Borough as, as rector, his wife, uh, they were offered, he and his wife were offered a rectory, and I will show you that later. And Lady Mary Bevan, who not only was in the aristocracy, but also had money with a capital M, said, no, I'm not going to live there. So they built their own. And this, from 1900 to 1910, was the rectory uh, and then it uh, became the Red House and more recently became Furlong House uh, but it was built by the Bevans in 1900 uh, because Lady Mary wouldn't accept what the diocese was going to offer her. While I was talking briefly about Furlong House I forgot to show you its back, those of you who don't know it. Uh, uh, that was the rectory in 1900 to 1910. Anyway, we've now arrived at what some people will think of as our folly, uh, the tower, Mansion House Tower, uh, and it could be just that. The legend has it that it was built to deter French troops from coming as far as Hurstpier Point. I'll explain. It was built in the first decade of the 19th century when there was a great fear of an invasion from Napoleon and his troops. And those of you who are familiar with Brighton as it now is will think of it with an upper promenade and a lower promenade, all nice and flat. And, but before those promenades were built, it was a gently shelving beach, very easy to run boats up onto, and then over the downs. And the theory was that the first thing they would see was this tower and this wall, which is heavily covered with ivy now. But as we go further down, you will see that it was crenellated rather like the top of the tower. Um, if you believe that was defensible, uh, uh, I'm, I think you've got a very great um, deal of faith. But nevertheless, uh, when you go down the road, you will see how the theory arose. What is certain is that the fear of invasion was very real uh, such that there was a, uh, a, a measure to move the aged and the infirm, the women and the children out of the uh, coastal area and just beyond the downs, further up country, if there had been an invasion. Um, the farm wagons and the horses and the carters who drove the wagons, the people who were to go in those wagons, were all detailed and there is a wadge of papers at least that thick in Sus West Sussex Record Office showing all the farms and all the people that were to be evacuated when invasion came. It never did come, so it, it, they were, those um, ideas were not put into operation. But bearing in mind that this is exactly the same time as the tower was built, uh, it is not beyond the bounds of possibility that some clever clogs thought that from a distance it might look very important. It says it all really. This stone was laid by Mary Gertrude Campion and Margaret Hamlin F. Borough uh, in 1890. 
uh, as the parish room. Um, my cynical self says that the parish, when they gave the land, they couldn't find any other use for it, so I might just as well build a parish hall on it. Now go right up close to the gate. I'll stand back, would you? I've seen it before. <laughs> and look at the ponds either side of the path, and with not a great stretch of imagination, you could think that the house was moated. You know, with water both sides. Anyway, it was owned and occupied in the 1930s by John Denman, who was an architect who wanted to establish what he thought of as an arts and crafts enclave here. So he tarted up Carey's, he did something to Yeoman's, he did quite a lot here to Oldways, he dealt with Oldways Cottage and Bealside in the, in the hope of developing an arts and crafts um, area in this road. Um, the conversion of Pat Gwynne's printing works has gone quite well. It's not arts and crafts, but at least it blends in somehow. But John Denman would have turned in his grave if he'd seen Westfell on court. Uh, not quite arts and crafts, I don't think. Yeah. Right, now if we move across to the wall over there, you can again sit down while I do the next bit. Now I said that all this was beautified or uh, tarted up, whichever way you want like to think of it, in the 1930s. But of course the buildings uh, were here long before that. And Bealdside, previously called Beals, and Chichester House round the corner in the high street with the portico and the odd corner right tucked in the corner by Nationwide Building Society were all one building and was built uh, in the early years of the 19th century by Lawrence Smith who was a solicitor and he called it Brick House. Now that may seem a pretty un un inspiring name but it implies that it may well have been the first built, first house built from the beginning of brick. A lot of the earlier houses were timber framed and faced up with brick. And we've got plenty of those in the high street to show you. But um, this was the brick house for a while. Then it was called North House. And I never understood why, because the view to the north is not very inspiring and it, there was no view to the south. Anyway, it eventually was sold by Lawrence Smith uh, in about in the mid-1880s to the Diocese of Chichester, where it became under Gertrude Campions, whose name was on the uh, found, foundation stone there, became a training establishment for the daughters of uh, families in the workhouses all over Sussex. By that time it was union workhouses dotted around the county and the plan was that these girls should be taught how to wait at table and clean floors and do laundry and all the domestic chores and then be found jobs either in the UK or overseas, particularly in Canada. Uh, the worry was, of course, that these girls would follow their parents into the workhouse and nothing was done for them. So the Chichester House Training School was established in the mid-1880s uh, and went on until the 1920s. I keep mentioning the census. The, the, 19, the 1891 census showed Chichester House as being occupied by a matron, six or eight staff, and 35 girls, ranging in age from 16 down to five, who were being trained, as I said. What the five-year-old was learning, I'm not quite sure. She may have been a sibling of one of the older girls, but otherwise it seems a bit odd that she was being taught domestic chores. The 1901 census, 
didn't show Chichester House, and yet we knew from other sources that it continued to work until the 1920s. And this was a bit odd. The census enumerator had enumerated the properties to the west, and he went on enumerating the properties to the east, but Chichester House didn't exist. Flip over the pages of his uh, enumerated forms, and you find that he's put Chichester House up by South Avenue at the far end, far end of the high street. He just forgot, you know. <laughs> Uh, couldn't fit it in, in into the proper space, so it was down well away from it, where it should be. Now, before you go up into David Harry's driveway, remind yourself of the architecture of the building which houses the co-op, uh, the pet shop and the cafe. Again, by looking up to the upper stories and you will know without a doubt that it's one building. Yes? So now we get out of the way of the passing traffic. And that one building is shown here in 1907. It was built in 1902 by Masters and Tully, who uh, were the proprietors of a genuine department store. Uh, still here when we came in 1957, I think it subsided in the 1960s, but nevertheless. It was a genuine department store, not as big as Hannington's of Brighton, and certainly not as um, uh, capable of survival as uh, John Lewis or Peter Jones, but nevertheless, you could buy anything from a three-piece suite to a single screw and pass butter and onions on the way. Um, uh, they built that property to uh, increase their space and in 1907 this uh, banner was put up uh, across the high street uh, not by uh, the festival committee or uh, any, anything like that but by the villagers themselves and it said Miss Elsie, good luck. Uh, Miss Elsie was not Miss Elsie, she, her name was Alice, but they called her Elsie. Um, uh, she was getting married uh, and she was an accomplished horsewoman. She was a, a Alice Campion from Danny and they uh, lo loved her so much that they put up this across the road. I don't suppose you would get it now <laughs> if you were going, getting married. Anyway, that was 1907. And the uh, Masters and Tullys eventually expanded to the extent that their um, furniture department had to move across to behind where that uh, pantechnical is now, uh, in the ground floor below the dental practice. Um, so they expanded quite a lot, and then eventually they um, uh, had to cease to trade in the 1960s. And the building that they, that uh, superseded was this one here uh, of uh, the 19th century, um, a smaller property, but they'd been around at least since the 1840s. As I shall explain later, they came into the most exciting story in the 1880s the Great Fire of Hurstbeer Point, but um, um, yes, I'll, I'll keep it to the right place. <laughs> now, hopefully the coach house lorry will move, it's moving, yes, and showing us the new inn. The new inn uh, became the new inn in 1811. Uh, Richard Weeks's diary uh, tells us that on a particular day, uh, the magistrates decided to withdraw for the last time the license of the Royal Oak, which is where Hartley is, the wine shop now is, uh, because there's been so much rowdyism there. Uh, they'd taken away the license several times before, but this was the last time. And um, the, the license was transferred across the road to what became the new inn. Of course, before that, it was a private house. 
it was a Wealden house. Now we're getting into technical land now. The Wealden house, a particular kind of uh, domestic architecture, whereby the main body of the house had two wings built out to the front. And it was a hall house, like Little Park, so that they had a fire in the floor and the smoke got out uh, at, at the roof ends, if you were lucky, otherwise it was smoky inside. Uh, um, and uh, then they decided to keep up with the Joneses and they filled in the gap in the middle between the two wings and faced up the front. And they faced it up with cement as you now see it. And and doing that sort of thing was really just a matter of keeping up with the Joneses. This, this was before it was a pub. Um, it just showed that they had sufficient money to be able to do it. As did the close studying the vertical timbers with, with, between the brickwork there on the west elevation. Now that was an indication that you had more money than you knew what to do with because I've been told by a number of builders that it doesn't increase the strength of the wall at all. It's just to show that you could put up more timbers for show. In that wall, for the people just there, you'll have to come round, you'll see what was clearly a window. Uh, simple frame, it's now closed in. But when it was used as a window, it did not have glass in it. It was what's called a rabbit skin window. Not necessarily a rabbit, but an animal inner skin treated and then stretched over a frame, which you use uh, when you wanted light in on a stairway, for example, but you were not concerned to be able to see out. Uh, so whenever you see a window frame like that, you can be sure that it's a rabbit skin window, or was a rabbit skin window. Uh, not very many of them about, but you do see them occasionally in old buildings. And that brings me to Mansion House opposite, which we now know from dendrochronology, that's a lovely long word, um, the age of some of the timbers of Mansion House. 1380, so that puts you back a bit. Um, but of course, much of the house is later than that. And it uh, came into its own in the 19th century, really. Oh, in the 18th century, Mrs. Beard of the cattle on the town field lived there. But in the 19th century, uh, one of the doctors, and I'll describe the hierarchy of the doctors in a few minutes. <coughs> he lived there <coughs> and um, had his practice there. Uh, it was faced up in brick, and this you should think that the blanked out window was because of the window tax. It was done after the window tax was repealed. Um, part of the facing up, they, this building has not just been brick faced on this front, but it's also been brick faced on the west elevation, which you can see when we walk down the high street and look back and it has been uh, faced with proper bricks and stone coins. And of course, very recently, as of yesterday, as far as the door case is concerned, been repainted. Um, it looked in a sorry state for a long time, but um, the present owners have um, uh, sorted it out. They've got a lot of work to do inside, but nevertheless. Is it a home? Yeah, yeah. It it was a home all the way through, uh, even when Dick Weeks, as the doctor, occupied it. And there's one occasion when it had more than its normal complement of occupants, which was 1851, the same year that I mentioned Blackstone House, where Hampers now is, also had a peak in occupation. So there were two buildings in the high street which suddenly had an influx of uh, human beings. Any ideas as to why? School. School, absolutely. The notice to the left of the door case says that this was the first home of Hurstpier Point College in Hurst. 
uh, the Willard schools, or the southern division of them, started in Shoreham by Nathaniel Woodard, who, was, um, who lived in Henfield, uh, and he founded Lansing, Hurst and Ardenrye. When he founded them, it was stipulated that Lansing should be for the sons of gentry, Hurst for the sons of professional men, and Ardenrye for the sons of tradesmen. You know, it's, done, it's not like that now. <laughs> but nevertheless, that's how it, how it was ordained by Nathaniel Woodard. So he established each of those schools in a large house in Shoreham, and when they were of sufficient size, they were moved out to their final um, buildings. Here in Hearst, there was a stopping off halfway. They came to Hearst to be in the Mansion House and Blackstone House while the buildings north of the village were being finished. Well, being finished enough to occupy. Um, so, um, uh, if you, I don't ask you to cross the road now, it's too dangerous, but that's what that notice on the side of the door case says. Uh, from the face, refacing of Mansion House, if we turn to the building on this side of the street, Wickham House, at first glance it seems like a smaller version of the same treatment. However, these apparent bricks are in fact tiles made of the same material as roof tiles and hung on battens in the same way. They differ in having two facets, one sloping, the other vertical, with space between the verticals filled with mortar to produce the whole brick effect. These are called mathematical tiles. There are two other examples in Hearst, but many properties in Lewis have this type of facing, some being glazed to resist the possible effects of salt in the atmosphere. The coins are of wood, not stone, and when the paint peels in time, the deception becomes obvious. Now we're going to walk down to the next entry beyond this white painted building, and on your way, just look at that little post down on the curb, just beyond the lamppost. See what you make of it. The answers in triplicate, please. Distance. Distance, Distance. yes, from? Distance to Station, Station correct. Ah. And that way to what was the King's Head, where the traffic lights are out at the far end of the village. So it was assumed that this was roughly the centre of the village. And it was put against that wall, I suppose, because it was out of the way of all the retail things. The house here, Northern House, now divided into two, uh, was built by Richard Weeks, of, of which more, of whom more and on. Um, uh, um, and uh, his son, Dick Weeks, was the doctor who lived over in the mansion house. Behind you, is what is now called Down House. In the early 18th century, it was the Swan Inn, frequented by Thomas Marchant, our diarist, who um, recorded that he spent sixpence or a shilling on drink on a Saturday night here, and on the Sunday morning following, he was unable to carry out his duties as church warden. <laughs> It was sort of minor peeps, warts and all. He did, uh, but he was the fish. He was a fish farmer, like the rest of the family, uh, and recorded his fish farming. But he also recorded uh, his activities here in the Swan Inn. Let it be said that it wasn't only where he caroused on Saturday evening. It was the place where the middling men of the village uh, dealt with the business of the village before. Uh, the parish council started. Outside the limits of the church vestry, but nevertheless of influence in the village. So the Royal Oak wasn't all uh, yachts. <laughs>
Right, move on to the next entry. This is now called Norfolk House and it became Norfolk House in 1954 when a lady from Norfolk bought it. Simple as that. It had been for seven centuries before that Mats, M-A-T-T-S. Uh, why someone felt they should or could change the name uh, just like that, but that's what happened. Uh, and so it was Matt's uh, first mentioned in 1335. Um, and then in the Civil War in the 17th century, it was occupied as the rectory by Christopher Swales, who had a pretty torrid time of it. He was a royalist rector in a parliamentarian area. And he refused, for example, to publish the edicts of parliament from the pulpit, just tore them up or threw them away. And eventually uh, the Commonwealth, no, it was before the Commonwealth, eventually the parliament got fed up with him and they removed him. Uh, lovely word, they sequestrated him and put in their own man. But I may say only after three attempts. There were two intervening uh, rectors who didn't last more than five minutes, as it were. And then, uh, then Letchford came and he became the rector. Uh, still Matt's here uh, and it remained the rectory until the beginning of the 18th century. We'll see the rectory of that uh, century later. Then in 1877, it was bought by Richard Weeks, a surgeon from Shoreham, who established his practice here in Hurst, still called Matt's. Uh, and his diary uh, recounts not only that the Royal Oak was closed and the license transferred to the New Inn, but how he visited his patients in Henfield, in Ditchley, in Pycombe, uh, and elsewhere, on horseback, all in one morning. Uh, busy man, and obviously very much uh, sought after by uh, the people around. And it was this house in 1900 that Lady Mary Bevan said, no, I'm not going to live there. So, um, you know, if you've got the money, you can do it, can't you? And when the Bevans moved from this parish to one in Buckinghamshire, it again became the rectory. And it was the rectory from 1910 to 1954 when it was bought from this, by this lady from Norfolk. Now this is now called Chantry House, uh, but from 1808 to 1897 when the Bevans came, it was the rectory. It was built in 1808 because the previous rectory was still occupied by the family who had amongst its numbers uh, the late rector. Um, and it was built by the rector Minard Shaw uh, and he put up a stone or brick wall about eight feet high all the way along and Dick, uh, Richard Weeks's daughter Grace wrote a little history of Hearst and she said well, what a pity it was that the parish priest had cut himself off from his parishioners. Ten years later, another young historian, whose house we shall see, uh, said what an elegant house it was. I paused in my mid-step, <laughs> because I can't think of it elegant. It is true that Kerry Hampton Borough changed the aspect to the other side, but if you can recall what it looks, that looks like from the car park, it's no better. He did it when he extended the building uh, to provide 12 bedrooms for his 12 children. Um, he was here for 57 years, so he had time to do it. But 
elegant, I can't believe. Right, now we'll walk on down to the village garden. Now we come to the exciting bit, the Great Fire of Hurstfield Point. 1882, it started in Walter Fitch's establishment, which is where Nationwide now is. Uh, it's not quite the same architecture, but there is no doubt that it was that building. Walter Fitch was uh, an ironmonger and general merchant, um, and he had quite a sizable staff. Uh, young men who lived in, up in the garrets, and one of them, one day in January 1882, smelled smoke, raised the alarm, and uh, everyone got out with their buckets and tried to put the fire out themselves. Uh, they were almost successful, they thought they'd been almost successful, but then it broke out again. So they decided they had to get help. In 1882 there was no telephone, that came, came 14 years later to Hurstbury Point, but there was telegraph. So they telegraphed Burgess Hill, Stenning and Brighton fire brigades and asked for their help. Burgess Hill and Stenning said, thank you for the invitation, but no, we're not coming. <laughs> uh, Brighton, on the other hand, said, yes, we will come. And they came up the London Road on a horse-drawn appliance, following the same route that the road is now, but of course not as wide. Uh, and the fire station was where the fire station is now, Preston Turkey, but again a smaller building. Came up the London Road, but the appliance would only carry six men. So the rest of them got the train at Brighton Station, came up to Hassett's Gate Station and walked to Hurstbier Point. <laughs> now, in spite of all that, alarm raised at 5.15, by 7.30, they'd almost got the fire under control. What they failed to remember, and Walter Fitch is the biggest culprit in this, that amongst his varied stock was gunpowder. Oh, no. And soon after 7.30, the roof blew off. And the fire then raged for a further three days, oh, attracting God. sightseers from all around. Um, Kerry Hampton Borough, the only comment was that his paint had been blistered by the heat. Um, but nevertheless, they eventually got the fire under control, but that terrace was completely ruined. Round the corner from Nationwide was what was Lawrence Smith's uh, house, eventually called North House. And here on this side, West End Cottage, and neither of those suffered from the blaze, which is quite remarkable because here is West End Cottage, and you can tell it's exactly the same building because of the stars on the chimney stacks. There is Tommy Pierce, who lived in the cottage and had his carpenter shop there. So if the fire had got there, it would have gone up. Jan Tons would not have um, uh, been in business. So. And there is a report in the local paper of one of the firemen standing on that chimney stack, the, ne the one nearer to the terrace, pouring water into the blaze. Mm -hmm. Health and safety. <laughs> <laughs> this is the sort of property it was. There. Okay. Yes. Uh, and it finished, finished here. But it all had to be demolished. And then when they rebuilt it, uh, the first occupant of Reflections was not a hairdresser, but a butcher, Alan Botting, who previously had had his butcher's shop down where Columbines is, the other side of the garden. Uh, and it was a purpose-built uh, butcher shop with a slaughterhouse through the gateway and behind. I think that's it here. Uh, we'll go to the crossroads. Right, from this standpoint, we can see Lamb House and the buildings beyond it. Built by Richard Weeks of Matts, as it was then, Norfolk House. Uh, because 
this road had become the turnpike road from Cookfield to Paikoum and he thought the stagecoaches would come this way so it's a good place to have a staging in. Unfortunately for Richard Weeks the stagecoach operators in their wisdom decided to go via Stone Pound and so this was a white elephant right from the beginning. Uh, It lasted very little time as the staging in, stagecoach in, uh, became a pub for a short time, then that uh, ceased to acquire business because of the other pubs, I suppose, in the village. It became then a private school for girls. And we had, had a friend who died about 10 years ago who recalled going to that school and sitting on a high stool with no back, not for one lesson, but for the whole morning, run by two French ladies who are very, very, very strict. They refused to allow their pupils to fraternize with the pupils from the National School just next door, which was difficult for Olive Beckett because she lived next door to one of them and they walked back home, back both ways, uh, to lunch. Eventually the rump of it was the Lamb Pub which is the uh, small uh, um, building to the far side of the archway um, and up until 10 years, 15 years ago it had a little picture of a white lamb up, up, up on the pressure board. And you would be wise if you wanted to have a beer in the lamb to knock on the door before you went in because the dartboard was on the other side. <laughs> <laughs>
They were there by 1911, but somewhere in that decade, the high street was numbered. So number 43 existed in the first decade of the 20th century. It was the communal bathhouse. The, the back there and the building's gone, but that's why it's a missing number. Borrow, when he came here in 1841, had St Lawrence Church torn down in 1843, and this was built and consecrated by 1845. Now, not bad going when you haven't got mechanical aids for your building, in, in less than two years, actually. Um, unfortunately, it was built of Sussex sandstone, so it's as porous as you make it lets the water in anywhere. It's one of the pleasures of being a church warden, which I remember vaguely. <laughs> Behind you, a pair of cottages uh, erected by one man uh, in the 1830s. That man was, if I can find him, yep was Richard Davy, lovely painting of him, and his wife Sarah. Richard, when he was a young man, married Sarah and then promptly went off to the army. Now don't ask me why the two, if the two events are connected, but anyway, there is a little book called Over the Hills and Far Away in the library, which uh, records his letters from the peninsula, from Spain and Portugal, back to Sarah in Hearst. When he was eventually discharged from the army, he had reached the rank of staff sergeant and he got a pension, of course, for that. He came back here to Hearst and became the sexton, the grave digger, um, and then eventually became parish clerk. And between his army pension and the money he got from uh, his church and parish duties, he built uh, these two houses behind us and he built these two cottages here to which of extensions have been made that one to the west is part of that house this one to the east is a new house and it occupies uh, where the chapel of ease was for the um, funeral director who had his office here up there are three fire marks similar to the one at Little Park that I showed you in the picture and they were put there as a, 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 a proof that the occupier had paid fire insurance. Um, I must admit I wonder whether the firemen come along and say oh you haven't got a fire, fire mark so I won't bother about your fire. I'll do the one next door. I think that's a bit, bit far-fetched. The far mark at Little Park, where we were right at the beginning of the walk, we've got the documents uh, which support the paying of the premium. £300 for the house at Little Park and £300 for the barns around the farmyard, which of course were very valuable to a farmer. Uh, but that was in 1723, we've got the document, and 300 pounds, quite a lot of money. From this position, you can see three buildings with front out shots. There's the old lion, was called the red lion previously. Uh, there's this one, which is only half the distance out, and there's that one there, which is a full outshot. Now the two outer ones, the old lion and that one, uh, were beer houses. Uh, that was called the oak, still called the oak when we arrived here. Um, if you see a front outshot, as opposed to a scullery and bathroom on the rear of the building, you can probably bet that it was a beer house. Um, the beer was brewed quite often by the lady of the house, the, her husband being a farm labourer or something like that. And in order to keep the sale area from the domestic part of the house, they built a bar parlour 
out, out the front. This one's not a pub, this was a shop um, used by um, a chap called Walter Peskett. Who, yeah. Well, the, the house is still called Peskett. Yeah. Um, Peskett was a miller, and the mill was out where the dual carriageway A23 now is. And we knew where it was on the map. And when they excavated for the cutting there, they found the foundations. All got covered over again in the, in the process of building the road, but nevertheless, we knew it was there. And of course, that was nice and convenient, because he milled his flour there and sold it here. Uh, he was a corn chanter. And he had uh, a family, one of whom was Clement Peskett, who was a tailor. When I was researching the high street, I was a bit thrown by the fact that I found him here as a young boy, seven, about 17, and then I found him uh, up at the corner where the cook shop now is. Uh, I think I've got a picture of that with um, rather grandly um, decorating his window. Next, next one, must be. Yep, there he is, Peskitz on the, cor on the corner where the bookshop now is. And he's very ambitious about his window dressing, he just got bales of cloth there. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that was Clement Peskitt, and that was when he was 50 odd. And where had he been since he was in his teens here, in 50 odd? He'd have been at three other addresses in the high street running his tailor's business. He just moved about and finished up there. Now, um, oh, while we're here, can I just show you on the curbstones? Lost it. Oh, there it is. This, this cutout. Any idea what it uh, indicates? stand there to look at it. It's a T and it stands for telephone. In the days before fiber optic cables, uh, the telephone cable was copper and it was uh, very um, sensitive to moisture. And the place where it would break down was at the joints between uh, lengths of copper cable. And they marked those joints with these T's. I've found six along the high street and we'll look at another one in a minute or two. But, um, so that's what they were, something very practical. So they didn't dig up the whole of the curbstone, they just did, took that one curbstone out and the um, faulty joint would be there. This is Howard Lodge, uh, the second of those young historians, William Smith Ellis, lived here with his father uh, and his main complaint was that when he walked back from the crossroads, his view of his beautiful house, remember he was the one who thought that what we call Chantry House was beautiful, uh, the view of his beautiful house was obscured by the cottages built up the high street, uh, which is, even if you think it, it's not the thing you put in a history. <laughs> anyway, this, the west wing of Howard Lodge, is dated 1728. Uh, and while we were living just across the road, uh, it gradually fell into disrepair and was sold. And the new owners um, decided to do a big job on it and they got the builders in and the first thing that happened was the front wall fell out but it wasn't a brick house originally it was a timber framed house so it was just the cladding that fell out but nevertheless it added to the work they had to do and they did a major refurbishment on the main building and on the coach house 
uh, around the corner there. Now this is the last stop. Pit stop. <laughs> yeah, the last stop. This is not a pit stop. This is this is the the flag going down. <laughs> First of all, the white horse. On this elevation of the white horse, you see a depiction of a white horse, and although it's obscured by a road sign, the date 1591. So I think most people would think the pub had been there since 1591. The two things are together, the white horse and the date. No, it got its license in 1816. 1591 is probably the date of the middle bit of the building, the one with the higher ridge. Certainly, the, this bit here is 20th century, no doubt. Um, so, um, don't always believe what you see on the building. 1591 may have been the original structure, but it's not, nothing to do with the pub although they will pass it off as being there as a pub since then. Now we turn around to Policeman's Lane and down the bottom on the right hand side is a genuine Elizabethan cottage, Cowdery's, again named after the occupiers, Thomas and Cordelia Cowdery, uh, documented as being there in 1609, so it was there before, before them. In the 18th century, in Thomas Marchant's diary, he records the fact that uh, he saw old Cowdery's house being pulled down. Well, I think it was materialised again, uh, because it, it, it wasn't pulled down. Three days later, he records the fact that he saw the timber for the new staircase at Cowdery is being brought in. What they had done was to take off the rear wall of the house and build a stair turret uh, to get from the ground floor to the first floor. Prior to that, you had to use a ladder. Way back in the Dark Ages, Jean and I went on a car tour of the Dordogne one year and in the 1970s, and we arrived at a pension that we'd booked rather late, so La Patron said, you better eat first and I'll show you your room afterwards. So we had a very substantial French dinner with plenty of French wine. And then she said, well, I better show you your room. Out of the front door, along the front elevation, turn the corner, a ladder up to the front door. <laughs> uh, she said, it will be all right next year, but we weren't there next year. <laughs> So that was what happened in 1717. They put in a staircase in Cowdery's. Come on to the 20th century, and it was occupied by Marjorie and Joan Penny, who used to live at the Grange, which is now Lady Mead Nursing Home, along the road there. And when their parents died, they felt it was too big for them. They owned all the fields immediately behind as well. So they sold up and moved to Cowdery's. And they said, um, we love each other very dearly, but we do want our own space. So they each built an extension. Marjorie's extension is the last bit of the roof going south, and Joan had an equivalent bit going west. So they had their own sitting room and, and bedroom. Then eventually Marjorie died, and Joan felt that even that was too much for her. So she had a bungalow built behind these bushes here uh, on Cowdery land. Uh, so she didn't have to buy the land. She just had to, had, had to pay for the building. And because her name was Joan Penny, she called her house Coppers. <laughs> and hence Policeman's Lane. The alternative theory, and I don't hold with it, is that it's Policeman's Lane because when the yobs came out of the White Horse, making a noise up the high street, the local bobby would go round Policeman's Lane and catch them at the crossroads. Mm -hmm. But it's not quite as solid as the one I've told you. 
There are those of us who think it ought to be called Treep's Lane because John Treep's, also mentioned in um, John, uh, Tom March, Thomas Marchant's diary, was a metal worker. He had a small forge just beyond the Mini Cooper there in the semi-basement uh, and it is still there to this day, although Alison Moulds stores her marmalade jars there. I'm not, she doesn't do any metal work, mm -hmm. uh, but it's still there. Um, Thomas Marchant has references to my Lord Treeps put a ferrule on my walking stick, my Lord Treeps mended a lock, my Lord Treeps did this, that and the other. He was of the nobility, it was to Thomas Marchant's jocular way of referring to the artisans he used. His farrier was my Lord Grey. <laughs> <laughs> um, so John Treeps lived in the western third of that house there, uh, Treep's house as it now is, uh, in the 18th century. In the 19th century it progressively became two dwellings and then one dwelling. By the 1851 census it was occupied by William Mitten, the chemist from up the road, and his family. Uh, I've mentioned Flora and Bessie but the eldest daughter was Annie, and she was not a chemist, she was a botanist, and she had a friend called Richard Spruce who used to come down from Barnes to have holidays down here, and he stayed for his holiday at number 29, which was the nearer of the two cottages opposite the church, uh, painted a, a rather definite um, orange. Uh, um, it's faded, it's mellowed, but it's, anyway. Um, and he visited the Mitten family at, at Treeps, and on one occasion he brought a, another friend of his, who was Alfred Russell Wallace, uh, who was a contemporary of Darwin, who came to the same conclusions about evolution as Darwin, but Darwin got to publish first, uh, and so his origin of the species uh, seems to take precedent over Wallace's the Malay Archipelago, but he wrote the Malay Ar Archipelago here, and the green plaque records that fact. He had the last laugh over Darwin because he got the Order of Merit, which wasn't in existence when Darwin died. <laughs> um, so that's... Um, and they've taken, I'm pleased to say, I mean, as a passerby, I'm pleased to say they've at last taken off the board behind the gateway so that you can see through. Because it's a, a pleasant enough view of the garden. Strangely enough, that labourer's cottage plus labourer's cottage plus labourer's cottage and now has a Georgian door case in, in the middle of it. But, it, incongruous as it may be in theory, it seems to work. I think that's it. I think I've finished. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Amazing. Uh, right. Uh, you go home and rest your feet. Yes. Yeah, I'm here. Me too. Me too. But I don't have far to go, you see. I, I engineered it properly. Near house, just the field. Oh, I'm sorry. There's one other thing. One other thing before you go. I mentioned when we were at Whittle Park that carp and pigeons were useful fresh food in the winter, and the dovecot was down beyond Treep's Cottage at a house which is called Culvercroft, and the pigeons were culvers. Uh, so the other house nearby, culvers. Uh, Calvers was an old name for pigeons. Thank you very, very much indeed. Yeah. Okay, you. right, Thank you. okay, right. Anyway, Thank you. Good. Thank you very much. Thank you. I hope I haven't bored you. No, no, no.